Do you want to set a mood or create an illusion in your garden? We're talking color right after this. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now in today's show, we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, and that is color. You know, of the principles of design, and there are 12 of them that I follow as a garden designer, number seven is color. However, for most of us, I think when we think of beautiful gardens, color is number one. Now, technically speaking, color is orchestrating the color palette in the garden through the selection and arrangement of plants and objects. Of course, it's really more than that. You see, color is the paint on your paintbrush, and in many ways, it's how you define what kind of gardener you are. Do you like roses, wildflowers, or is your garden subtle shades of green? Take a look at yours with fresh eyes, and you may notice something about yourself you never knew before. So, you guessed it, today's focus is all on color. Whether it's gathering a bouquet in the garden or thinking about the preferred colors for any given season. Now, there's a lot going on out here in the way of color and construction, but just look at that beautiful golden fireworks goldenrod back there. Yes, it's a goldenrod, but it won't make you sneeze. And take a look at this beauty. This is called Caryopteris. Not only do you get that chartreuse leaf, but look at that incredible blue flower. Suffice it to say, we're going to see loads of examples like this in today's show. So why don't we get started by first taking a look at the construction progress in the garden home. I'm taking my shoes off because we can finally get in the house, but I don't want to scuff up these gorgeous floors. You can see we've already started moving furniture in. These floors are all made from southern yellow pine, and they were laid where the joints are really tightly placed together. Once they got them in, they sanded them so they had a really smooth finish. And then after that, we took a very simple process. And what I mean by that is I looked at lots of different stain colors. I knew I wanted it to look as natural as possible, so we didn't add any stain. All we used was a tongue oil finish. And what this did was reinforce and strengthen the wood fibers because what happens is the tongue oil actually seeps into those fibers and gives them a lot of strength. The other thing that I really like about it is that it feels like, well, it feels like it's had this hand rub finish on it. It's, it's almost a matte finish with just a little gloss, not too shiny like I would have had with a polyurethane. So I'm very pleased with the way these have turned out. And now we're beginning to bring the furniture in. Now, you know, they had to put four different coats of this for it to penetrate all the way through and to get it to a place where we could actually begin to use it. And it took about 24 hours for it to dry completely before we could begin bringing in rugs and furniture and so forth. And that's where we find ourselves today. It's really getting exciting. We've tried to consider every green alternative from rainwater harvesting to the basement and the foundation and even to the paint. It was important to me to use a low VOC paint. Now what that means is a paint that is low on volatile organic compounds. Think about gasoline. You know how you can smell gasoline? Well, that is a very volatile organic compound, those fumes coming off. So there are paints now that actually don't emit as many of those compounds as they did in the past. And that's what we've used here. Now, I love this color because it looks like it was derived directly from nature. This color is called Nantucket Breeze, and you see it's juxtaposed the trim, which is called Super White. Now, in the room just behind me, the back parlor, it's a slightly darker tone of this same color family. It's called Dried Parsley. And it works so well with my collection of lily pad plates that go up the wall. Now, we've got construction going on in the basement, 
and I just decided, guys, you got to get out of the attic, you got to get out of the second floor and the main floor, and you can work in the basement, but I'm ready to get this thing decorated and done, and that's where we are. You know, it's really interesting what influences our taste and style. And you know, color plays such an important role in that. I have to say, I tend to like the colors that I'm around at any given time. I like them all. But I do try to divide them up into color, I guess, families. Like here, we've got a range of pastels, like this gorgeous rose here that's sort of a salmon pink. Roses really make me happy, and I have lots of them planted out here. Now you have to wonder, those folks who create beautiful flowers like this through their breeding programs, what influences them and what gets them started down a certain path to create a certain kind of, well, rose? Jacques Mouchat is a rose breeder, and he tells us about his fascinating job and about his interest in roses. To decide to become a rose breeder, you've got to be young and, and ready to work a long time. There's one point interesting to know is the roses are performing better in places where they can get some kind of winter dormancy. They need to stop growing in the winter time in order to, to be nice and to remain beautiful for the next summer. I'm not sure of the performance of all these roses under subtropical conditions. Normally under sub tropical conditions such as in southern Florida. Roses might have more difficulties, but I'm sure that rose enthusiasts can develop techniques that will uh, enable them to do so. And one of them that, is, that can be useful is to induce the dormancy necessary for roses by drought. If you can protect your roses, if you can severely uh, water stress your roses, it brings the plants into a dormancy, and when you bring the water back, it's spring again for the plant, and the plant will produce a, a, another very wonderful flush. If the drift roses are grown in container, they need to have a daily watering and a weekly feeding, weekly liquid feeding. But the daily watering is important because the rose is sucking a lot of water out of the pot, and if they're sitting out in the sun, in one day you can kill your plants, and there there is no other possibility. If you grow the roses in the ground, the very best, the very best condition is bring the water via a, a drip irrigation system. If you have no uh, drip irrigation system with a overhead irrigation, uh, once a week, but done in the morning in order to allow the foliage to dry before the end of the day. I always say that water is the number one feeding necessity for roses. So bring ro water to your roses if you want to, them to be happy. Now it's time to visit a place that many of you should easily recognize, Churchill Downs in Louisville, Kentucky. I recently had a chance to visit and was able to check out their greenhouse and the amazing tropicals they had inside. If you've looked around lately at some interesting containers or landscapes, you may have seen some things that look very familiar to you, but in an odd place. There is a huge resurgence in this country now to use what we considered house plants many times tropicals out in the landscape, either in beds or in containers. Now, it's interesting to me that styles change. Back in the Victorian period, well, that was all the rage because all of these tropical plants were coming from various places around the world and the owners could not wait to showcase them in their gardens, in their containers, and in their greenhouses. Now, the reason for this today, I think, is because Tropicals can add a certain pizzazz, certainly in the way of color and texture. The other thing is that they're just unique. It's like you've got something your neighbor doesn't have. And the third thing is that they grow very fast. For instance, take a look at this. This is a euphorbia. It's called euphorbia catinifolia. Now the reason it's called catinifolia is it looks like a catinus or a purple smoke tree in its leaf. And you see the leaf on this, and if you compare it to the purple smoke tree, you'll see what I'm talking about. Can make an outstanding foliage plant in a container or in the bed. And you have to remember, the more sun it gets, the more those deep burgundy colors come through. Some other foliage plants you might want to consider would be some of the elephant ears. And what about this chartreuse one called lime zinger? And then for other foliage plants, you can't forget about the cannas and a close relative, the heliconias, 
which have beautiful, interesting little flowers on them. And then if we get into some of the other house plants like snake plant or Sansevieria, we all remember those from our grandmother's back porch. They have made a comeback. So when you're thinking about planting your garden, once the temperatures warm up, you might think of some of these foliage plants that are tropicals that will give your garden some real pizzazz. I'm always looking for ways to bring the garden indoors. And one of the simplest ways, and I think most effective, is to just cut a bouquet of flowers. That's what I'm doing here. Just look at these zinnias. This is a variety called canary. Wonder where it got its name, huh? Look at that gorgeous color. And then down here, I've got a little flower called a melopodium. And I just love the way that these are almost the same color as the canary zinnias. Now, just think about this. What an intense color. What better way to brighten up a room or put a dazzling bouquet of these on a table when you're entertaining friends? Now, I just don't stop with annuals grown from seed for bouquets. I will collect anything, bulbs, perennials, tree limbs, even shrubs. For instance, I have many types of heritage and modern roses. I have tons of daffodils that bloom early, some that bloom mid, and others that bloom late. And when I entertain for friends and family, I always try to incorporate my love of plants with my love of entertaining. For instance, bringing the party outside during a crisp autumn evening can be magical. Mother Nature provides the breathtaking landscape as well as a wonderful centerpiece. Everybody knows that autumn is full of wonderful color all around you. And I believe you should get out there and enjoy it. I've added different sizes and shapes with pumpkins and gourds to create this perfect setting. By just tossing in a few branches and lighting a few candles, I have an elegant autumn table setting for my guests to enjoy. Inviting Mother Nature to the dinner table can be done in any season. Here's another example. This colorful table setting works in early spring. With the warmth of a wood-burning fire setting the scene, I've placed red tulips, almost like the sparks of the fire jumping from the chandelier. Instead of adding candles to the chandelier, these tulips create a different, more appealing atmosphere. These varieties include one of my favorite called Perestroika. And just take a look at the table. The centerpiece here won't get in the way of conversation. You see, the whole idea is to get creative with what Mother Nature provides for us. Adding a little nature to the table can make a simple gathering an event to remember. <music> You know, as a garden designer, I've learned to never underestimate the color green. There's so many different colors of green. It's really hard to imagine. Now, I want to show you something very unique. This plant, you don't typically see clipped as a hedge. Yes, it's a green hedge, but if you look closer, you'll see some little fruits on it, which will tell the story as to what this is. This is actually called hardy orange or trifolate orange, or a poncirus. And if you look even closer, you'll see that it has some very long pernicious thorns. Now in the fall, these leaves will turn yellow and they'll defoliate, they'll fall off the tree. And then you'll see these fruits that will be, look like little tiny orange lemons. Okay, now this grows in full sun, obviously. If you wanna grow a poncirus like this, you need full sun. But let's step in a shade garden here and meet a friend of mine where you'll see something equally unique and equally green. Come on. Hey, Rick. I hope it's okay to walk on your beautiful carpet. Yes, please, please do. It's very wear resistant. Well, you know, there's just nothing like the texture of moss for a shade garden like this. It's a wonderful ground cover. This is what happens in a really moist, shady environment. And in, in, in Eastern Long Island, the moss just comes by itself. You know, the juxtaposition of, of the moss with, with all of these hostas, I mean, it's really sublime. Yes, the, the various shades of green, I think, really work well together. I think we, we underestimate green and it's such an attractive color to us. I think it's a, for me at least, it's a calming color. I, I agree. I think people often forget that green is a color too and yeah. that there's so many different shades. You add this vertical element in here with the, the trunks of the beach and the oaks, so these gray 
vertical elements really add another level of visual interest. And I think also the roots um, add a, a different uh, texture to the, to the ground plane as well. There's so many hostas to choose from, but I have to say some of the good old garden variety ones still work for me. And that's mostly what we have here. Um, uh, one of my favorites is uh, Siboldiana elegans, uh, old standby, yeah. and Fra its sister, Frances Williams, is, a, is another beauty. Love that big heart-shaped leaf. Yes, and, and the uh, the quilting, the texture, I think, yeah. is really good. Yeah, too. I love some in substance. I see it here as well. You, well, you can't find a better plant for brightening up the shade with its, its big golden leaves. Yeah, I mean, it, it brings light really with it, doesn't it? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yes. just a gorgeous, gorgeous hosta. I also saw some Crosa Regal, which which will take actually some sun. I love that plant. Yeah, it's very versatile. It will take some sun, uh, especially if it's not afternoon sun, and it has a very stately look to it uh, because of, of of how the leaves are held. What I like so much about what I see here is that many of these hostas, well, most of them are really common or ordinary hostas that you can find in most garden centers. You can start out with some large ones and you, you've, you've taken these common things, these ordinary things, and, and planted them in an extraordinary way in big masses. Rick, thank you so much for sharing this beautiful garden with me. You're welcome, I'm glad you came. I enjoy having lots of animals out here at the Garden Home Retreat, like this flock of giant Dulap Toulouse geese. They're a French heritage breed, and they're hanging out with those little Bantam apple yard ducks. Now, they're certainly colorful, but they're nothing in comparison when it comes to color to the peacocks. The peafowl here are beautiful. We have two males, Castor and Pollux, and they're always lurking around here somewhere. I don't see them right now. We have several females, or peahens. Now, what's interesting about this bird, it is definitely majestic. It's in the pheasant family, and it's the national bird of India. That's where they come from. In fact, the variety we have here is called a blue India peafowl. The baby chicks are called pea chicks, no surprise there. Now, the female will lay a clutch of eggs, and they will hatch in 28 days, just like a turkey. And when it comes to feed, we feed them just like we do the turkeys. They love a, a high protein diet and a little bit of corn, and they're able to free range on the property. So they're picking up all kinds of insects as well as plenty of green things to eat. Now you might think such an exotic bird in the pheasant family would need protection in the winter. Well, actually here in zone seven, they can roost in the trees and are quite content. They feel like they're getting away from predators and the cold doesn't seem to bother them. Now I admit that a peacock really isn't a cuddly, fuzzy little pet, but they are fun to have out here to watch. They're really dramatic. Well, this is the part of the show where you, the viewer, send to me photographs of your home. We take a look at ways we might improve the landscape. Now, today, we have a brand new house in Georgia. Now, Cassie tells me that what she's dealing with here is hard red Georgia clay. I know something about that. Now, I know that it's a brand new landscape, and we've got a few shrubs planted, but I want to make a few suggestions that may require us moving them. For instance, these look like ligustrums here. It looks like Cassie has two, four, six, seven. What I would do is plant them, Cassie, in a curve back here, and I would clean out all of this under the pine tree. You'll be amazed at what a difference that will make. Now you've got, it looks like a variegated privet here, 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 and here, which means we have about four of them. And what I would do is come down here on the property line and get a big grouping of them kind of together over here on this side. See that? Now, you've got this concrete retaining wall here that we need to be mindful of, and there's a swale that runs right through here, S-W-A-L-E, a low place to shed the water because I understand that, that your, your drainage works from the top of the property down, so it hits the swale and goes around. So whatever we do, we have to be mindful of that. All right, now let's erase this and get started. I'm going to keep that line there so we remain mindful of it. What I would do is, since you don't have any trees, let's start with framing the house. 
I would certainly come down here and think about framing the house with two kinds of trees at the very least. And I would even come along this driveway perhaps with the trees. But you could line the driveway with red maple, which are gorgeous in the fall. And if you wanted to add another fast growing variety, which will do well in your part of the world, would be the tulip poplar. So you could have maybe a tulip poplar here. Then think about some ornamentals, and I'm gonna use a different color for those. What if back here uh, we did some flowering cherries? The Yoshino cherry is certainly gorgeous, and a Yoshino, Yoshino cherry back here would help give it some balance. You might even come along the side here with some Yoshino cherries back here in this back area. Okay, now let's take a look at the foundation planting. I'd like to echo the color off of your shutters. You have that sort of burgundy color. So what if we covered this concrete retaining wall with red laura petalum? And what if we came over here and created some red laura petalum, just a drift of it here? So again, we're balancing the property. And then what if we came on the corners and planted a foster holly here and a foster holly here, kind of a nice conical holly like that. And then on either side of the interior where this foster holly is, let's do a big bank of low azaleas here and here. You didn't give me any directions on exactly if the house faces north or south or whatever, so I'm assuming you could grow azaleas there. They don't need to be grown in full hot sun. And then what I would suggest here is a different type of shrub, one there and there and there and one there where we create rhythm. So we have one, two, three, four. And those could be any type of evergreen you'd like, something slightly columnar. They could be uh, a Japanese plum you. They could be uh, some sort of holly that would stay very small, but you're punctuating all the way across the house. And then in this bed, again, more of the same. I would add these areas across here, and I would do boxwood, and I'm gonna change colors here. I'm gonna go back to red. Boxwood, boxwood, and a boxwood here. And then on this side of the swale, of the sidewalk here, you've got this big group of, remember, our red laura petalum over here. What I would do is add some boxwoods that would come up to the side and one over here to create a sense of entry. You could even do a picket fence here and take those boxwoods and line them up all across this side of the swale and let them come back around on that so you create an enclosure in this space because you do have a lot of property. Well, Cassie, I hope this helps. You certainly have what a lot of us don't have, a tabula rasa or blank slate to start from. It's very exciting. You know, this side of the garden is really coming together, and it's thanks to the structural plants around it and to the color. Look at the color echo going on between this variegated agave americana and the chartreuse color that you see in the leaf of this coleus, a great performer. Well, that's all the time we have in today's show. I hope it's inspired you to use color in really fun ways. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.